Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Sustainability Sundays. I wanted to talk about managing eco anxiety and mental health while organizing and trying to deal with the many different challenges that exist in the climate space. It's been a real journey for me. I've been working on this for years now and I've had the full gamut of experiences. I wanted to share some tips and tools that I've picked up over these few years in the hopes that it's helpful for others out there who face the same challenges. I guess if we were to talk about sort of my personal CV and the experiences that I've had, I've been volunteering in climate for about six years now in very different ways. I've been part of co-founding two separate climate movements that still exist today. I've published a book chapter on climate change. I've done numerous engagements with the media, with the press, and I've engaged with governments, businesses, and civil society organizations. But in that time, I've faced enormous challenges with regards to my mental health. And that's something that I wanted to discuss today. When I was reflecting on my journey, I broke it down into four different parts. And the first part really is about disappointment with the world. When I was just entering ring university. One of the stories that I read was about the Larsen Sea ice shelf. This was basically a big chunk of a glacier in Antarctica that had sort of carved itself off from the rest of the ice shelf. For most of a year, scientists have watched a giant crack creep across Antarctica's Larsen Sea ice shelf, forming an iceberg the size of Delaware. This is an ice shelf that was sitting there stable for over 10,000 years. It's gone. Reading about this ice shelf breaking off, really broke me for some reason. In the middle of the evening, just at my desk in my room, I was bawling my eyes out over a glacier that had broken off I don't know how many thousands of miles away. From now until the day I die, that ice shelf, that state of nature is not going to be restored. And that was very, very, very depressing for me. And I think that also brings me to my first tool um, that I would share, I guess, with, with folks. In essence, there are three circles in our life. And this first circle is the circle of control. And it represents everything that you have control over. And encapsulating that, we have the circle of influence. And then beyond that, it's a massive, huge circle, which is the circle of concern. And that's everything that we don't have influence and we don't have control over, but we're still concerned about in life. And for me, the ice shelf was in this circle of concern. And it was something that, that I was grieving about, but I didn't really have any means to control it or influence it whatsoever. I think this tool is useful for sort of drawing boundaries on what we are thinking about. So that also covers my, my second tip, not reading all the news that there is. Oftentimes, it tends to be that the things that are the most depressing and saddening in life fall within our circle of concern, but they are outside of circle of influence and circle of control. And the things that bring us the most joy are inside this circle of influence and control. And so one of the things that I found really helpful is to reduce the amount of media, the amount of news that I'm taking in so that the circle of concern gets a little bit smaller and to spend time on things that I'm intimately connected with, that I have control and have influence over so that I'm focused on the things that give me happiness and joy in this lifetime. I set up a climate Twitter about a year ago and I followed all the big names in climate change and I realized that I cannot spend more than five minutes a day on that Twitter account because the only thing that the big climate accounts tweet about is how we're in a terrible dire situation and not enough is being done which is true and it's an important message but it's not one that i need to read 10 times a day now that's not to say that you don't read the news at all you cut yourself off but it needs to be managed right and, and there needs to be a way that you segregate and you decide how much you want to take in and or the second step of my journey was really growing into activism so my second tip would be to surround yourself with like-minded people one of the things that i found challenging at first about looking at the climate issue was just that my friends weren't concerned about it and so by taking out organizing activism, I started to find myself in circles where other people felt the same as me. And secondly, it gave me people to be able to bounce ideas and thoughts off. But more than anything, these were also people who are willing to spend time and energy and effort towards achieving the same goal. People will say, hey, there's the risk of being in, in an echo chamber. And so that's where other relationships that we have in our life come in. But at the same time, it's really valuable having an inner sanctum of people who understand what you're worried about, why you're worried about it. Partway through my university journey, uh, I had the opportunity to do, to do an exchange program in the US. During my time on exchange, I spent a random weekend going for a environmental spirituality retreat. And that got me really interested to think about the intersections between climate, the environment and the spiritual, aspect of our life. But the retreat was centered around the work that reconnects. The work was crafted by 
a lady called Joanna Mace. And she's a environmentalist, spiritual leader. Back then, she was working on uh, anti-nuclear activism. She noticed that among many of the people that she was organizing with, many of them started getting burnt out and depressed because they weren't seeing the desired outcomes that they had. And so she started thinking about how do we build a set of spiritual practices to support activists in the work that they do and to ensure that you know they're healthy and they're thriving while still campaigning for important change and so together with molly brown joanna wrote this book called coming back to life and within the book there are a huge set of practices that basically outline different ways in which we can nourish ourselves so that we can continue to organize and do other important work the practices are available online for free it takes you through a spiral there is a theoretical sequence to the activities that people do. It starts off with expressing gratitude and recognizing the things that we're lucky um, to have in our life. We then move on to honoring our pain and hurt for the world. And then there is an aspect of seeing with new eyes, looking at deep time practice or looking at different ways in which we can see the world. And then sort of working on next steps and how do we bring ourselves forward to continue in the work. Organizing and, and activism in general tends to only focus on the going forth part of the work. Uh, it's always looking at what's next what do we do next and there isn't much time spent on thinking about things that we're lucky to have and expressing gratitude there isn't much time spent grieving and thinking about the things that hurt us and the things that we've lost and i would highly recommend these practices to to anybody who is working in the activism space uh, especially on on climate activism because it can be really tough another sort of tool that i guess i discovered on exchange was the plum village tradition this is a buddhist tradition founded by a peace activist named Thich Nhat Hanh. He passed away relatively recently, actually. I think it was a month or two ago. He talks a lot about the intersection between Buddhism and the environment, specifically on the climate. And just to give you, I guess, a flavor of the sort of things that he would say, I wanted to share an excerpt of a speech that he gave to the UNFCCC. It's quite magical and it really spoke to me and it speaks to some of the challenges that we see in environmentalism. And he says, many of us think we need more money, more power or more status before we can be happy. We're so busy spending our lives chasing after money, power and status that we ignore all the conditions for happiness already available. At the same time, we lose ourselves in buying and consuming things we don't need, putting a heavy strain on both our bodies and the planet, as well as the carbon dioxide pollution of our physical environment. We can speak of the spiritual pollution of our human environment the toxic and destructive atmosphere we're creating with our way of consuming. We need to consume in such a way that truly sustains our peace and happiness. Only when we're sustainable as humans will our civilization become sustainable. It is possible to be happy in the here and the now. We need to consume in such a way that keeps our compassion alive. And yet many of us consume in a way that is very violent. Forests are cut down to raise cattle for beef or to grow grain for liquor, while millions in the world are dying of starvation. Reducing the amount of meat we eat and alcohol we consume by 50% is a true act of love for ourselves, for the earth, and for one another. Eating with compassion can already help transform the situation our planet is facing and restore balance to ourselves and the earth. So that's a small sample of Thich Nhat Hanh's writing. He has written extensively on the environment. There are many different books that he has published, and I would highly recommend it for anyone looking for a spiritual guidance or spiritual reading companion together with environmental work. We reached the third phase and I'm going to give a content warning that I'll be talking about suicidal ideation and depression. Uh, these were aspects of my journey, but if these are potential triggers for you, feel free to just skip ahead or mute this until part four. Part three of my journey was one in which I really, really struggled. Outwardly, you know, things looked like they were going really well. That was the time when I was writing a book chapter as well for publication. I also was featured in the local newspapers um, about the work that I was doing and the things that I was engaged in. But that was all on the outside, really. And deep down inside, I was not doing well at all. Retrospectively, looking back, I was really burnt out. I was really depressed. I didn't feel that we were getting any progress. We were making headlines and making news and getting attention, but I didn't see it translating into any sort of real progress. And for me, that felt like a very, very personal failure. Uh, in some ways, I felt like I was solely responsible for shifting the climate trajectory of my country. And looking back, that's a really, really stupid statement to say, because <laughs> who am I to uh, have impact on a whole nation's climate objectives? Uh, but that's what it felt like at the time and, and i think part of that mindset also came from the fact that i was spending just so much time organized i was spending so much effort that i didn't have time for anything else i remember also one of the days i was reading some negative climate news and i just didn't feel anything i think i would characterize that entire time period as just 
being entirely numb. I didn't feel joy. I didn't feel sadness. I didn't really feel despair. It was just very flat. And I woke up every day, worked until I was tired, and then I went to sleep. And it was just cycled that for weeks on end. I was also questioning, I guess, whether or not I, you know, was having any impact, whether there was any point in, in staying alive. Basically, I remember quite clearly that at some point I started thinking about ending my life because I didn't feel that there was a space or place for me on this planet. I didn't feel that, you know, any of the politicians or people we were working with or trying to advocate against were taking us seriously. I started Googling for like endless ways to end my life, um, thinking about logistics and how I would handle it. Thankfully, it never really got to the point of wanting to make it an, an actionable outcome, but it definitely was on my mind. You know, there were many mornings where I woke up and I was wondering, would I be happier if I weren't alive? I ended up watching a play. The play is titled The Sun. The story of The Sun is basically about a couple going through a divorce and they have a son and the son is depressed. And the play sort of follows that journey. I just kept listening to what The Sun was saying. And I was like, I think these thoughts all the time, every day. He was thinking um, about ending his life. He was thinking about the struggles and the things that he was struggling with. And there was one line in particular that really struck me. And the line was, sometimes I feel I'm not made for this life. And we are making basically a world that is not suitable or hospitable to many different forms of life. And at that point, I felt like I was included in that group of people. I was crying nonstop in the theater, basically, because I finally felt seen, I finally felt heard, I finally felt understood. Because after I finished watching the play, I knew that I needed to get help. I realized that if I continued on the path that I had been on, I wouldn't be around for very long. That's another tool that I would suggest is that for folks working in this space, when you find yourself you know, in a challenging situation, get professional help. A friend once told me that as we age and as we get into adulthood, we start finding adult problems that need adult support and adult solutions. And I think therapy and counseling was the single best thing that I could have ever done for myself. And I'm so grateful to my, for my, to my past self for deciding to go on that route. Being able to work with a professional therapist really helped me to unpack some of the things that were bogging me down and that I found really challenging. And it helped me untie some childhood knots as well that really contributed to the depression that I felt. And if you're contemplating it, if you're on the fence, I would highly recommend it. There are just some topics that talking with your friends, talking with your parents, isn't really going to help with because they're not trained and they don't have the knowledge. But linked to that, I think, were several other tips that I found really helpful in helping to reframe how I was thinking about climate activism. So the first tip I think that I really realized through therapy was that it's really important to have an identity outside of climate change. I was spending so much time on climate activism at this point in time that I had no other identity. And so when we failed to get any progress in terms of climate, I as a person had failed in my sole duty and therefore, you know, I didn't deserve to live. For me, it's it's so that I'm not solely defined by climate activism and it, that there are other things that I become and that there are other ways for me to find and create joy and happiness in this lifetime rather than just solving the climate crisis. Find something outside of climate change that gives you joy that gives you meaning. The second tip is to not be afraid to take a break if you need to. I was placing myself too much in the narrative. So there's this article from Quartz that was shared with me recently. It says that we all experience the world like we are at the center of reality. But in truth, and this is the really important line, we're just one of billions. And over the course of history, everything about us is insignificant. Even people like Newton and Einstein who were revered for their contributions to humanity they're only slightly less insignificant. This realization was very liberating. It allowed me to really stop placing so much pressure and burden on myself. The way that I think about it is that the universe with me has a particular trajectory. If on the day that you were born, you weren't born, you didn't exist, the trajectory of the universe without you and I would generally be about the same. That was so liberating for me. And I was able to step back and say, hey, I need a break. I need to not think about climate for a while. There will still be other people who can fill that role if the theory of gravity wasn't discovered by Isaac Newton. Somebody else would have, would have found. We are just small beings among a big crowded planet trying to find our way. And it's okay if we don't contribute to the story for a little while. The last tip is to be kind. The whole reason why I work on climate is to reduce suffering. And 
one of the things that I've seen is that actually in movements, in activism, people can be pretty mean. There's a tendency to replicate all the nasty things that we're trying to undo. I've seen people be really demanding and I too actually am guilty of having been really demanding of people and not very compassionate. You never know what anyone is going through. So it's so important to, to be kind. And I also think that it's important to have compassion and empathy for everybody including the people that sit on the other side of the table. Our lives, they are somewhat shaped by us, but they're also a product of so much of the outside influence. And so it's really hard to blame any one person for the actions and, and, and steps that they take. Be gentle, be kind, be compassionate to the people you're working with, and also demand that they treat you with the same. That I think is a really important part of building a better world. After getting you know professional help, things really turned around for me. I found ways that I was able to contribute and still be positive. So now you know I'm I'm moving forward into the next part of my journey. I'm working full time in the sustainability field, which is a huge blessing, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also working on some small personal climate projects. There are two other tips I would close off with. I think the first one is understanding that that we all change. Um, it's been such a journey of growth of finding out what I'm interested in and what I'm not interested in. And I think it's important that we allow ourselves and other people to change. Maybe you find that what you were doing before is no longer what you're interested in or what you're good at. Or maybe you don't even believe in this theory of change anymore. I think it's important to give yourself that space and to be able to change and step away from what no longer calls to us. And I think it's important that we really not hold it against each other for wanting to try something else or for realizing that we're being called in a different direction. The world is large, we're varied, and there's so many different things that you can do, and there's so many different ways in which change is achieved. Uh, don't limit yourself to one particular mindset or one particular way of doing things. I've learned so much um, in terms of maintaining my mental health, and hopefully something in this sharing was helpful for you. So that's it for today's Sustainability Sundays. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, any comments.